You have an amazing gift. Um, I had the opportunity to hear of him from one of our worship leaders who was going down there ministering and said, oh, this is a great church you should get to know. And as time went on, my best friend is mentored by him. I, um, and so he said, oh man, Dr. Phil's a great guy. We just never connected. And an opportunity arose to go speak for them and went down and saw the hospitality and the um, just uh, wisdom and intelligence that he possessed. And as I was following him online, Mano, I saw that his strong suit was definitely leadership and marriage and relationships. So I said, wow, this would be a great opportunity to have you come share in that capacity, whether it be leadership or marriage. And we happen to have this marriage intensive and thought, what a great opportunity to put it together. Um, and so he is a intelligent communicator, earned doctorate, not an honorary doctorate, praise the Lord. And that's important to mention nowadays. Um, and just an incredible mind. He pastors in Fort Myers, as well as uh, launching a campus in Naples, Florida. So without any further ado, you can clap it up for my friend, uh, Dr. Phil, as he comes. Good evening. Good evening. Well, it is such a joy to finally make it here to the Kingdom Church. Um, I feel like I'm in the Kingdom. <laughs> And um, I am so honored to be able to come tonight and just to be a part of what God is doing among you guys. And your pastor is someone that I admire from a distance just for his leadership and his visionary prowess. Um, how many of you guys know leaders need to follow other leaders? Amen. Right? So um, you, you always want to follow someone who's doing something at a high level. And uh, want, your pastor is one of those people that I kind of like, I'm like, this guy is, is, he's on it. And so we've kind of, we're building this relationship. Um, we still have some issues with LeBron and stuff, but we'll get through that. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm not a LeBron fan. I mean, I am a Miami Heat fan, so I'm grateful for the two chips. Any Miami Heat fans in here? All right. But um, I just, I'm just, I'm just trying to get over the way he left us, you know, like that nasty separation. So, um, so pray for me. I'm trying to get over that. But it's really an honor to be here tonight. I am, um, Delighted to be able to come and talk uh, to you about what it means to um, have a God-honoring marriage. And so tonight, I'm not really going to preach. We're going to have a conversation, all right? So somebody say conversation. conversation. And so that's why they asked me, do you want to be up here or do you want to be down here? I'm like, no, I want to be down here. I want to be close, be able to walk and touch people. Um, my wife and I, we've been married for uh, 27 years this year. Um, and uh, it's been 27 years. Um, Amazing years. I know you guys are probably saying 27 years. You're only like, you look like you're 30, so when did you get married? Well, I'm 48. I got married when I was 21 because I was a grown man at 21. Um, and uh, we have two young adult kids. Um, well, young adult kids. My son's married. He has his own family. And uh, my daughter's in her second year of college. So um, we're just, and this is, this is our heart. Our heart is helping families. I just give you a little backstory. Um, I didn't grow up in a, in a traditional home. I, I was a child of an extramarital affair or not even a marital affair. I was, I was a child, an outside child, didn't grow up with a, with a dad. So didn't have any image of what a marriage should look like. And the ones that I did see, uh, they were not healthy. So you can always use an experience to either duplicate that or learn from that and do the complete opposite. And so when I saw those b bad examples, I'm like, that's everything that I don't want if I ever get married. So um, I know for most of us, those of us who are of African descent or from the Caribbean, uh, we become husbands by accident. <laughs> right? We, we don't usually have a blueprint. We don't have someone that gives us the, the guide and how to do it. And so we figure it out on the job. It's on the job training. How many of you guys can relate to that? So we, we, we fumble and we make our way through it. But... When, when a church like this church takes time to invest in a marriage ministry, that is something that is rare and it is to be commended because there's a lot of people, I say, who are dying at a buffet line, yes. wow. Wow. who are starving at a buffet line. The Bible is the buffet and you have people who are dying of starvation. 
when it comes to marriage principles and biblical principles. And so tonight we're going to begin a conversation, a dialogue on how can we position ourselves to be better people. Better people make better wives, better husbands, better fathers. So it's really not about your marriage. It's about you that's going to make your marriage better. Right? And so tonight we're going to talk about this whole idea of power, money, and sex. So how many of you guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. So I want to have fun. I, I really want to have fun with this. I always say this. Um, I, I say this. What if we, what if we change? Oh, so that's Emma. Uh, for those of you that are uh, uh, wondering what she looks like, um, the Lord has been good to us. She went through a very, very tough battle three years ago with ovarian and uh, uterine cancer. And so God has given us victory over that. So we're grateful for that. Right. And so, um, so really, 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 really happy to have her as uh, just an amazing, amazing mate. So I would say this, um, what if we change the question, right? What if we change the initial question that we ask when the guy gets on one knee or goes by the beach and, you know, whatever, however you choose to do it. Now they make a whole big thing out of it. You got to record it and everything. When I did mine, it was just, we just went to restaurants like, okay, um, do you want to take this ride with me, right? So what if we change the question from um, will you marry me to will you grow with me? That, that would, that's a game changer, right? So because a lot of times when people get married, after the wedding, they put a period on growth. And they stop growing. So it's almost like we settle. I did everything I could to get you now that I have you, I don't have to expand, and especially Christians, because they play on the fact that because you're a believer, you're not going anywhere. We're going to be real honest tonight, right? So, so what happens is you have frustration because of a lack of evolution, right? So I was teaching at a university a couple years ago, and one of the students asked me, says, okay, so Dr. Phil, you're a Christian, you're a pastor. Do you believe in creation or evolution? I said, I believe in both. And he says, you can't, you, can't, you can't have it both ways. He says, you got to be one. I said, I believe anything that's created must evolve. So in order for there to be evolution, there must first have been creation. So your marriage is a creation that demands evolution. Yes. And so what happens is when you stop evolving, you become stagnant. And now you become, you create frustration because someone is trying to grow and the other one's not trying to grow. And it's almost like you're pulling dead weight. So... If we were to change the question from will you marry me to will you go with me, all of a sudden now the expectations change. And once the expectations change, the behavior changes, right? Once the behavior changes, then the experience changes, right? So what I want to challenge you is to walk away from this and repropose to your significant other tonight. Repropose to them. When you get home, whether you do it in the bedroom or in the kitchen with some chicken wings or whatever, just don't do it while you're watching the Warriors game. I mean, just kind of like figure out, figure out, like, like, like really like say, hey, from this point forward, let's make up in our mind, we're not just going to be married, we're going to grow together. We're going to grow in love. We're going to grow in our purpose. And as we grow, we become fruitful and now people can benefit from us. Is that good? So, so that, that's what I want to challenge you tonight because here's the thing, because people say, so, so we're in love, so let's get married. Two blindfolded people walking into something that's complex, that's just like, I mean, like, we have no idea what we're doing. All we know is we want to have legal sex. <laughs> right? uh, we we want to have legal sex We don't want to come to church feeling guilty Because we had our hand in the cookie jar And we didn't have a license for it So let's just make this thing right before the Lord But it's never right the right way So we walk into this Blindfolded And we have no idea What to expect Right. So, so why does it happen Here's what I believe why marriages don't work Somebody read that for me. We build a foundation that's built on what society expects, what was handed down to us, and we ignore the word of God. So let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. This is the pivotal verse that marriage kind of pivots from, right? It is not good for man 
to be alone. That verse right there is the foundation on communal living, relationship, and why God brought Adam and Eve together. It is not good. Now, up to this point, everything that God had done, he signed off by saying it is good, right? When he gets to creation of man, he says it is very good. Now, is God telling himself that he, that he expressed or he just displayed incompetent by saying it's not good? What God was saying is that it is not beneficial. It is not to man's benefit that he be alone, right? And so if people are going to get married and marriage is a sacred thing, it's a divine thing, where do you think we should go for the manual on how to handle it? To the Word of God. But we go to Dr. Oz, we go to Oprah, we go to Beyonce, we go to Will and Jada. I mean, we go everywhere except on the truth. Or we do what is expected of us, not what God has already told us to do. Right? So, so let's talk about this real quickly. So three discoveries. I'm going to go through this real quick because I only have an hour and I could talk forever. So, uh, so what is marriage? Marriage is a covenant. What's the difference between a covenant and a contract? A contract has terms and conditions. A contract has expiration dates. A covenant is something between a man, a woman, and God. It's a threefold experience, right? Threefold relationship. A covenant in the Bible only ended with death. Only ended with death. And a covenant, even if you don't do your part, I'm still obligated to do my part because it's a covenant. Think about the relationship with God. How many times you and I mess up, yes. he still does his part because he's in a covenant relationship with us. Yes. See, if we elevated Christian marriage to that level, we would come to the church house before we go to the courthouse. See, marriage has been debased and, and minimized and ridiculed to the point where it's just a piece of paper. It means absolutely nothing. But here's what God said in Malachi. I was a witness between you and your wife. Okay? So let's talk about this. So marriage is a covenant, right? And then you have, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. It's not an arrangement. The reason why God created marriage was to put people in partnership. Now, if you're going to have a partnership, first of all, let's say we're going to start a business together. If we're going to become business partners, the first thing we have to do is we have the vision. What is this business about? Are we selling a product or a service? Right? And what is it that we're bringing to this business? Right? So we talk about what are our assets and our liabilities. Every partnership that's formed, you bring assets and liabilities. Right? So as a couple, when you walked into your marriage, you brought assets and you brought liabilities. Yeah. And I'm not talking about finance. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about habits, flaws, traits, strengths, weaknesses, trauma, yeah. childhood experience, your backstory, good or bad, right? So we don't ever think about marriages. We just think, well, hey, man, I found me a girl, man. We finna get together, you know? Like we about, yeah, man, she's a hot mama. Whoa, 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 whoa. Behind that beautiful look is a whole story that you need to figure out how, what, do your balance sheet we never do a balance sheet before we get married no. anybody who does economics will tell you you look at your balance sheet you look at your assets and your liabilities so let's with, so we create this partnership so we start with a covenant that what we create this partnership and then we create a family so what's going to make a marriage work is this big question what do we want to accomplish for our family and our legacy if you start with the end question being answered, you answer everything in between. If we want to give our children a model of marriage where they see healthy parents who have healthy conflicts, but they don't blow up, all of a sudden now, if that's your legacy that you want to leave, you manage your differences in a healthy way. If you want to leave generational wealth, you talk about your finances. Does that make sense? Are we, are we good so far? Yes. Are, we, are you guys tracking with me? So it begins, it begins with, with this understanding of God's portrait of marriage on how we ought to do this thing. So just follow me. I'm, I'm going to take you somewhere real quickly. So the three myths that we, have to, that we have to debunk that the world comes up with is this. Okay, so it's the three myths. So 
man and woman get together, okay? Notice God's view is covenant. The world's view is man and woman. Yeah. Well, today it's kind of yeah. my partner <laughs> or my lover, but we're, we're talking about God's design, right? right? Okay? So we have interests, so it's not really a partnership. It's more of an arrangement. I need someone to help me pay my apartment. I need someone to help me financially. So you're the, you're, you're the best option. So it's not really a partnership. So you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing. And then guess what we do? We're mom and dad and then we have these kids and we bring them into this thing. Yeah. So that's what marriage has become. It's become an arrangement of people living together but not doing life together. The worst thing you can do is to be at the same address with someone and not in the same home. Y'all just heard what I said? The worst experience you can have is to be in the same address as someone and be in a totally different home. Because we're both living our own reality. Nobody's leaving at 8.30. I know that. Nobody's leaving at 8.30. I can't always say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so any questions on this, on what I just talked about? Any questions? I'll take a couple of questions. I know I have a Q&A at the end, but I, I, when I teach, I always like to make sure that you're tracking with me. It's not a lecture, that it's a conversation, right? So... Feel free to ask questions on what I just talked about. If you want me to clarify something or go back and explain something, I'd be happy to. I have some friends here, Marcy and Girl. Hey, good to see you. It's good to see familiar faces in the building. So any questions for me? No? All right. So if no, there's no question, I'm going once, going twice, gone. All right. So let's talk about the power issue. Let's talk about the power. Let's settle this issue. Let's settle this issue of who's in charge. Um, so we live in a country today that promotes individuality. Let me do me, you do you. We two grown folks. I don't, I'm not accountable to you. Um, you know, I don't care if you're the man. You know, you're not gonna tell me what to do. I don't care if you're the, you're the woman, you're supposed to sh shut up and sit down and listen and just have babies and walk around bare feet. So, so, so how do we handle this from a biblical perspective, right? Because the first thing you have to answer, ask yourself is, are you an egalitarian or complementarian? Mm. Now, those are big terms that means absolutely nothing. It just means, do you see the woman as your equal or she's a complement to you? Right. That's the first thing you got to answer. So there are two different camps. There are some people who are egalitarians and there's some people who are complementarians. We think, well, the woman's job is to be subservient and the man is to be dominant. There's people think, well, they share, they share leadership. My understanding of Genesis chapter 2 and the entire Bible is that we are created in the image of God. The image of God doesn't have first class or second class. It's one image. His likeness. So everyone has worth, but God has given everybody different works to work out that worth. Yes, yes, come on. Are y'all tracking with me? Yes. Let me say it again. Everyone has what? Worth. worth, but God has given us different works to work out that worth. So once we start treating someone as less than, we're actually saying God created an inferior product. Are we tracking so far? We're going to get through this in a little bit, all right? So, so how do we do this? So, so let's walk this through. So when we talk about power, let's go from a biblical perspective. God is the ultimate power. He's sovereign. He's omnipotent. He is in charge, right? He's the creator. Now, as the creator, God decided that I'm going to make someone called Adam, meaning dust. I'm going to make a man. Okay? And then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. Right? So watch this now. You guys tracking with me? Who is God? It's God the Father, God the Son living in community. So everything that God does that replicates himself must represent community. Because he, God, the Father, God, the Son, live as a community. He says, I can't have a representation of me that's living outside of community. Because when you read, it says, let us make man, right? Yes. 
let us. So that's plural. That's so that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that's why, by the way, anywhere there's division, God cannot inhabit. His nature is not conducive to division. That's good. That's good. You can't invite God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in a marriage that's divided. He's not coming in there. That's why in Psalm 133 it says how good and pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell together. Right? In unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing. Life forever. So that's a whole nother sermon. Okay, so God creates Adam as the leader, right? So God gives Adam this mandate, cultivate the garden, you know, work, dominate, etc. Okay? Now God says the leader needs a developer. Because in order to extrapolate all that's in him, I've got to create someone to develop him. So watch this now. God creates Adam and Adam, then he gives him Eve as what? A developer. Women who are here tonight, you need to understand, you are not called to be a nuisance. You're called to be a developer. Amen. Come on. Come on. Now, men, you got to give her something to develop. Because she can't develop space. And she can't develop your sex or your gender. Are we good so far? We're going to be real good friends by the time this is over. We're already friends. All right. I love it. I love it. Put your hands together for me. He's like, we're already friends. So are you guys tracking with me here? So, so God says, I'm going to make him a helper. The word helper that God uses for Eve is the Hebrew word etzer. From where we get the word Ebenezer, which means God is our helper. So watch this now. When God has given Eve a title, he uses one of his attributes. Wow. Wow. Come on. Y'all miss what I just That's said. Good. The word helper is the word Etzer, E-T-Z-E-R. From where we get the word Ebenezer when Samuel said, until this point, God has been our Ebenezer. So every time you say the Lord is my helper, you're actually making reference to how God saw Eve as my gift to Adam wow. to develop him. Amen. So how are you going to treat, you're going to take your helper and make her a maid. Mm. Wow. You're misusing the gift. Mm. Hello. Hello. It's like me giving you a Bentley and all you do is haul trash with it. Imagine I gave you a brand new Bentley and all you did was carry trash out with it. You never showed up to TKC on a Sunday morning and like they say, pull up to the scene with my ceiling missing. Uh, I was just checking to see if y'all, y'all think I'm this old pastor that doesn't listen. Oh, okay. So, but, 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 but are, you, are you tracking with me? So, let, so where's this power issue come from? We both have power. We just, know, we just need to know when to apply it. Yes. It's not either or, it's both and. Are we good so far? Yes. Now, I know some guys will be like, wait, man, I don't agree, man. We in charge. Well, here's what makes a leader powerful. A leader is only powerful by the people you empower. Mm. Say that. Hello. If you are a great leader... You empower the people that's under your leadership so they are just as powerful as you are. Are we good so far? So, so, so for those of you who struggle with is the man in charge or is the woman in charge because she makes more money, from a biblical perspective, we're both in charge. We have to find out our strengths and our roles and then we work in that and we support each other and we complement each other. There are areas in my marriage, my wife is the leader, period. When it comes to saying no to people, I defer to her. <laughs> Come on, anybody, any woman here can agree with me? Because with me, I'll give away everything. I'll give away all our money. I'll, give, I'll say yes to 10 people for the same time slot. <laughs> so I defer to her. Honey, somebody asked me for... $200, do we have it? If she says no, I submit to that. <laughs> and usually there's a lot more no than yes. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? 
So, so it's not an either or. I know some, some, people, some men struggle with this. Listen to me. Men, listen. I want to talk to the men for a minute. If you have to feel like you are in charge, you're not in charge. Because leadership is not power. Leadership is influence. Period, poo. I have a young daughter, so she teaches me all these. I call her my cultural missionary. <laughs> Are we good so far? Yes. So any questions on this? So, so what's, what's Eve's job? What's Eve's job? Based on what I just told you, what's Eve's job? Develop. To develop. Yes. To pull out what's in the man. Yes. And that's why it's important that you tell your wife your vision. Because vision casters need vision catchers. Are we good? And that's why as a woman, your job is not to outdo your man. It's to do with him what God has called him to do. See, we expect the church to have a vision. We expect the organization to have a vision. But we don't expect the marriage to have a vision. You got to have a vision for your marriage. Where are we going? Where are we going five years from now? Besides working 40 hours a week. What are, we, what, what are we going to look like 40, five years, 10 years from now when the kids are grown? What's our finances going to look like? Where do we want to live? Are we going to live in this apartment forever? Hello? Are we going to just work until we get a pension plan? Or are we going to have a side hustle? You know, are, are, we, are we going to create... Anyway, that's a whole other story. So let's, let's talk about this real quickly. So let me get through this real quick. So let me, let me show you um, what I want to show you here real quickly. When you study the Bible in its entirety, you will find exactly what I'm talking about. Man has been given positional authority, yes? yes. Positional authority, I mean, by the fact that he's the man, he has divine authority. Agree or not? Yes. But here's the thing. Positional authority to exercise spiritual influence. Okay? He's a vision caster. He has skills. He has gifts, right? He's a provider. He's a caretaker. Now let's look at the woman. The woman has been given relational authority. Now when you put position and relationship together, you have a perfect marriage. You with me? The woman also has been given, she has to be spiritually influenced. Her strength comes from drawing from her husband's spiritual leadership. Now, if there is no spiritual leadership, she has to find that elsewhere. And all of a sudden, we have an imbalanced marriage. Men, Pastor David is not the first pastor of your wife. You are. He is not here to replace you. He is here to help you. Be a better man at home. It starts at home. You don't believe me? Look at every scripture in the Bible. God always spoke to the man when it came to spiritual direction. Fathers, teach your children this. Teach them when they walk, when they stand up, when they sit. Bind it on their foreheads. It was always the man's job to lead his family spiritually. Satan has done a very successful job at getting us to be I would say bamboozled, thinking that spirituality is a feminine thing, and we've left our post. Y'all not gonna have me back, huh? <laughs> but 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 watch. So, so what happens is because the men are present, but they're absent while they're present. We have a whole mess. Adam was right there when the serpent was rapping to his wife. That was, a, that, was a, that was a leadership failure. Yes. Yes. Okay, let me get out of here. <laughs> She's a vision catcher. She also has skills and gifts. Proverbs 31. This woman works. She's an entrepreneur. She looks out for the welfare of her husband. She handles the family budget well. She's not at the salon every day getting her nails done. She puts in braids as opposed to weave every three weeks. The braids last a little longer. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
<laughs> she has skills. So, so who has the power here? We both. We both bring something to the table, right? And science has proven, and I'm not going to give you the research, the data, women are smarter than men. Amen. Now, that's not a deficit for us as men. That's a plus. That's why God says it is not good for you to be without someone who's smarter than you. You know, women have like this, this sixth or seventh sense. My wife, every time I ignored what she told me, I paid a heavy price for it. She'd be like, be careful with this person. Be like, ah, girl, you're always tripping. Two, three years later. She's a provider. Now, when we think about provider in our context, we think I go home, I go to work, and I secure the bag. I bring home the bacon. Let me teach you something here tonight. God did not just call you to provide money for your house. You got to provide leadership. You got to provide support. And the woman has to provide what? Provide you with the atmosphere so you can lead well. So we're both powerful. I can't be all I'm supposed to be if you're not who you're supposed to be. Does that make sense? So this whole power struggle should end tonight. Seriously. Because the reason why God put you together is because there are things that you will contribute to each other's life that will make the marriage healthy. Now, anything that has two heads is a monster. Are we good? Yes. What I said? Anything that has more than one head is a what? Monster. It's a monster. <laughs> Someone has to hold the 51% card. And God has given that to the man from a divine standpoint. So you defer to your husband when it comes to making the final decision, but we arrive there together. Amen. Are we good? Yes. That's why conversation and documentation eliminates frustration. Y'all heard what I just said? Conversation and documentation eliminates frustration. We talked about it, we wrote it down. What happens in a lot of marriage, there's no conversation, there's no documentation, just frustration. I didn't know what you were doing. You just acted on your own. Now we got to pay the price. You went and bought this $40,000 truck. Now, now we, our credit's hurting. Now we're struggling. Why? Because you acted like you didn't need my advice. Now we both paying the price. And when you're married in this country, you both incur the same thing. They take both of our income tax returns. <laughs> it's called joint filing. <laughs> Are we good? There's nothing wrong with having conversations about major decisions that we both need to bring our, our opinion to the table. But if we're, if we're at a deadlock, and that's why, it's, it's coming back to the Bible, that's why when you are a godly man, your wife can trust you because she know you heard from the Lord. Are we good? And that's where the respect and the submission comes from. Your wife doesn't submit to your muscles. She submits to your relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Now, am I saying you should go home if your husband's not a godly man? You heard pastor. <laughs> You're not godly. So, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Because the Bible does say, even if your husband is an unbeliever, your behavior, your conduct should win him over. So give him time to get to where he needs to be. Pray him into it. Don't talk him into it. Y'all just missed what I just said. So, so, so the, this is what I call the shared power principle. And this is all biblical. Right? Are we good? How are we doing so far? So let's settle this power struggle. The power struggle is really not a struggle. It's a false narrative 
that someone has to dominate the other person. When you read Ephesians chapter 5, that talks about husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husband, a lot of pastors misinterpret that text. They jack it up all the time. So watch this now. Submission is such a powerful thing that God demands that the husband love the wife in order to make sure that he's managing her submission with love. Y'all, did you guys hear what I just said? Someone submitting to you is so powerful that God says, I'm giving you such a powerful privilege. Let me mitigate this by you loving her and not taking advantage of her submission. Yes, that's so good. That's so good. See, the world says, you need to submit. You're a woman, you need to submit. It is. Um, I, got, I got a whole marriage book. Someone says it should be in the book. Let me free plug right now. I wrote a book on marriage called Beyond the Bedroom Door. It's in the lobby and a workbook. So y'all got homework to do when you're done after this. Don't be looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> but I'm going to say just like Pastor David said, when you, when, you, when you buy one of my books, you're supporting the United Negro College Fund. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I, I was paying attention when you said that. Uh, Chase said, he said, he said, he said hey, listen, folks, why y'all so serious? Can we laugh a little bit? Life ain't that serious. COVID reminded us it's not that serious. Come on, clap it up for Jesus if you're having a good time. How are we having a good time so far? Are you guys learning? Are you learning? All right. So uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> Before he said it was so good. Yeah, the whole submission thing. So watch how, watch how it works. When you love someone, they don't have a problem submitting. Yes. When you submit to someone, they should have a problem loving. It's not either or. When you do your part, it's easier for me to do my part. A man's got to be crazy to mistreat a woman who submitted to him. Mm. And a woman's got to be crazy to disrespect a man who's showing her love. You got to be cray cray. I'm dead serious. If you're being loved, you have no problem following. If you're being respected, you have no problem in loving. So again, like Bill Belichick said, do your job. If you do your job, we don't have to say, well, pastor, I'm having a problem. By the wall. I'm about to walk out because she's not listening to me. Are you loving her? Well, he's not loving me. Are you respecting him? It's both. It's both. You, and, 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 and let me say this real quickly. Dang. It's almost, I swear there's like a devil in this watch. <laughs> I want to respect the time. I want to be invited back. Y'all not trying to get me not invited back. I don't, <laughs> but listen, seriously, I always tell a couple of this when I do premarital counseling. You have to define what respect looks like for you. Because not everybody interprets respect the same way. It's important that you define what respect means in your world. I'll give you a simple example. I am like busy, like Pastor Jack, we're busy. So about 15 years ago, I used to like, when I'm on the phone, like, you know, business or whatever, I'm walking in the house and I'm on the phone and, and, and I'm, 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 I'm tr I didn't finish the conversation. So I'm like, yeah. And my wife would be like, be like hi. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, she's see, realizing her man is hardworking, he's on the phone, he's grinding. Until one day we went on our anniversary trip, um, and I think we went to Mexico or somewhere, and we were talking about the things that, you know, we want to improve on. She said, you know what's really disrespectful? Is when you walk in on the phone. You can't tell the person to hang up to give me five minutes of attention. Now here I am thinking, She's thinking, man, my husband's a hard worker, and I'm disrespecting her. Now, had she not told me that, I would have kept doing it. So now what do I do? In the driveway, hey, I'm home. I'll call you back. I'm about to walk in the house. I'll call you back, or we'll talk later. I hang up every call before I walk in the house. She identified a behavior that was unacceptable, and I modified it. Your husband and your wife are not mind readers. They're not x-ray machines. They're not MRI machines. They don't read your mind. T 
tell them what disrespect looks like and sounds like. And once you're told, you're responsible. Because you are responsible for every truth that you hear. That's why the church is the most dangerous place on the earth. Because every time you hear truth on Sunday, guess what you're going to be held accountable for? The truth that you heard. You are a servant to Christ, but a slave to truth. Okay. <laughs> so how do we deal with this? So let me give you a little solution. Number one, to understand power, you got to have a shared vision. Somebody say shared vision. Shared vision. Shared vision. You got to be a stakeholder and not a placeholder. Mm. Okay. Clearly defined roles. Who does what? This is any team that's gonna work has to do this. How many of you guys remember Chicago Bulls before Phil Jackson, mm -hmm. when Jordan was scoring 50 and 60 and still losing? Mm -hmm. Okay, too too far. How many of you guys remember Kobe and Shaq before Phil Jackson got there? Okay, so what happened? Kobe was still a great player. Shaq was still a great player. They didn't have good coaching. Michael Jordan was still a great player. When Phil Jackson got to Chicago and the Lakers, the first thing was that he gave the team a shared vision. We want to win championships, right? Then he said, Dennis Rodman, your job is to rebound and get into Alonzo Mourning's head, right? 20 rebounds, I need you to rebound. Paxson, I need you to hit three pointers. Jordan, I don't need 35 from you, I need 28. Pippen, I need 23. Horace Grant, I need this, what? Clearly defined roles. We got to have defined roles in the marriage. Don't assume, well, because he's the man, he's supposed to do X, Y, Z. Because she's the woman, she's supposed to do X, Y, Z. We have strength and we have weaknesses. Some men are better with money and some women are better with money. Find out who's better and let them handle the checkbook. We're good? And then, this is extremely important. If you don't hear anything I say for the rest of the night, hear this. You got to have situational submission. We always talk about situational leadership. What do you do in a situation as a leader? Every situation calls for you to submit to the person who has the best idea. It's called humility. Are we good? You just learned a whole new term. Right? Situational what? Submission. There are times I have to submit to Emma because her idea is godly, it's laced with wisdom, and I have to put my masculine pride aside and say, honey, you got this. Yeah. And there are times she needs to submit to me because my idea is the best one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I said, situational what? Submission. Submission. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, submit one to another. People miss that verse up on top of the verse that says husband and wife. They miss and submit one to another. I submit to my leadership team at the church. There are times they will say, I'm stuck on that day. Pastor, this is not, it's a good idea, wrong timing. And I got to back off. I'm still the leader, but the team's idea and wisdom makes more sense. And I need to have enough. God in me to hear the voice of God through people. Amen. That's good. The God in you will help you hear the God that's speaking to you. Because God never conflicts his voice. We good? So we, we're, still on, we're still on the power part? Okay, let's get to the money part. Ooh, money, 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 money. Any questions? Any questions on the power part? Yes, sir. How did she deliver the question of? Um, no, we were we when we usually go on a retreat every year. I'm, I mean, an anniversary trip, and so we have a what we call we do an, a review of the year and an inventory. So the way she says she that when I said I said what are some things that I need to change going into next year. She said, you know something that's been bothering me for a while? It's when you walk in on the phone. 
And that's how we did. So I said, oh, so tell me about it. She said, I find that to be very disrespectful. And I said, oh, okay. Explain. And then she, she went ahead about it and explained. So this, the, 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 she didn't say it in a disrespectful way or like a condescending or like rebuking me. She just, so we were having a conversation and she brought it up. So that's how she delivered it to me. I always believe that we can, we can talk about tough things in a loving way. Because yeah. we're not adversaries, right? We're friends. We're spouses. Yeah? All right, so let's talk about any other questions on the power thing, because we'll come back to it a little bit. Yes? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Both love and respect needs to be defined. Like, you might think you're loving your wife by working hard and paying her bills, and all she wants to do is go to the park and have a ham and cheese sandwich. I mean, in addition to the bills being paid. <laughs> so, so, so it's important that we have conversations so we both understand each other. And here's the thing. Can I say this? Because we're evolving, what we needed at a certain point changes over time. And that's why it's important to have continual conversation to make sure that I'm not too far behind from where I thought we were three years ago. Because yes. Yes. life happens fast, right? And the demands keep coming. So it's important that we have these annual checkups and we have these conversations. That's why my wife and I, that's a non-negotiable for me. As, that's the David, as busy as you think I am, like I'm running all over the place. When it comes to December, everybody out of church knows December 18th, 19th, and my wedding anniversary on the 23rd. So it's somewhere between the 18th and 19th, I'm out of here. Yeah. I don't care if, you know, the president was coming to town, the church already knows that week, I'm out. Either I go to the Caribbean or I go to Europe or I go somewhere, you know, because I believe vacation requires three things, right? You change pace, face, and place. <laughs> what is that? Pace, face, and place. I don't go where anybody knows me. Don't ask me to preach. <laughs> I want to go somewhere where I can wear shorts because I got funny legs. <laughs> no, I want to go somewhere I can be myself. You know what I'm saying? And just slow down the pace. I get up when I want to, and then we have conversations. So my wife and I work together literally for 24 hours every day when we go on vacation because we're always together. We wake up together, we go to bed. We, we never leave each other for, for that seven days. She loves it because she gets undivided attention. She's like in heaven. Unless I get upset because she's late for dinner, and I'm like, because then that's the only thing. But I try. I've learned over 21, 27 years, give her enough time to get ready for dinner by getting ready first and just sit there and be like, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> Continual updates on how good you look. Now, can you look good for the final time and let's go? <laughs> oh, my God. There are certain arguments I have learned to not have with my wife. Arguments about shoes, about purse. You're not winning that one. They never have enough shoes. Black shoes, they got pumps, they got wedges, they got... I gave up on that 18 years ago. That's why I give her she money and I have he money. You know what she money? She can do whatever she wants to do with she money. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about money real quickly. Let's get out of here. Let's get, so let's talk about money. So let's talk about some biblical trends, truths about money. I'm going to talk about seven, but I'm not going to give you all seven and nine. Money is God's provision to meet our needs, not replace our needs. That's the first thing you need to understand. Money is a tool. It should not be a master. Okay? Are we good? Number two, like every other complex issue... It requires management. The Bible is full of management principles when it comes to finances. How you should handle it. How you should give it away. How you should spend it. That's called a budget. You cannot just live week to week, paycheck to paycheck, and you have no financial plan. I made that mistake for the first 12 years of my marriage. And I paid a very dear price for it. Now, does it matter who makes the most money? No. It shouldn't. Because here's what I teach couples. Once you start having two checking accounts, that means you have two different vision. Yes. 
Now, now can I save mine? And, and, and you know, we just, we just chip in. Well, what are you saving the rest for? That's the real question. Everybody's like, well, marriage is 50-50. Marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100-100. What do you want the other 50? If you're only putting 50% in, where's the other 50% going? Emma and I, from the time we were dating till now, we have one checking account. Everything we make goes in that checking account, and we spend from that checking account. Now, what if you had your own account before you got married? You can turn that into an escrow account, turn it into a safe, but you both should have access to it. There should be no secrets when it comes to money. The enemy will use that to drive a wedge in your marriage. I promise you he will. Well, I'm leaving right now. I don't like that part. <laughs> What's more important, the person you're with or the money that's in the bank? Have you ever seen a U-Haul truck, U-Haul truck tied to a hearse? Wow. Have you ever seen a Bank of America rep going down on the ground with you? <laughs> Money shouldn't be an issue. If we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we did the first part, we understand it's a partnership. There's honesty, there's transparency. It doesn't matter who makes the most money. I don't care. I, I, I mean, I would love for my wife to make more money than me for a change. I would love it. I get to chill a little bit. <laughs> I mean, some, we are, some of us guys, we're on this ego trip. Like if the woman has more money than we feel in fear. No. She might have more skills than you. She's more marketable. It's our money. And if your husband makes more money, if your husband's not working for a period of time, that doesn't give you reason to disrespect him. He's still the man of the house. Amen. He hasn't lost his manhood because he lost his employment. Amen. And you don't throw it in his face either. You're being ungodly at that point. And you don't tell your wife, well, you know, you need me. No, 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 no. She's got God. She's going to be all right. That's right. That's right. Oh, see, I even got a young witness in the house. <laughs> so wh- number three, somebody read number three for me. I want somebody to read number three for me. The Bible talks about Proverbs chapter 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, and watch them. The reason why God gives you wisdom is so you don't have to pray about everything. Wisdom is God's personal assistant that's accompanying you every day. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the proper application of truth and knowledge. Wisdom is not how old you are, how many gray hair you have. Wisdom is how can you place this truth in the right context for the right reason so that it brings the right result. Are we good? So the Bible is peppered with biblical principles, how to use money, how to save, how to invest, how to create a budget. As a matter of fact, anybody who's good in economics will tell you, you should not, if you cannot, if, you, if your household expenses cannot be between 50 and 60% of your income, you're living over, above your means. That means when we talk about your primary household, like mortgage, you know, electricity, blah, 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 all the, should be one fifty percent So if, we, if you're in debt, work out a debt reduction plan and make a commitment that you're not going to go back there again. If you have a credit card, make sure it's a joint credit card where we can track each other's spending. Create systems where you're accountable. If you're going to let people borrow money, that should be an agreement. My wife and I have an agreement. If we're going to let somebody borrow over $500, we need to clear with each other. And we only let people borrow money that we can afford to lose. Just these church folks. They'll leave the church before they pay you back. (laughs) Been there done that. Are we good? So let's talk about this real quickly. So, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So I really wanted to talk about seven, but I'm going to kind of reduce it down to these three because I think these three really helps us understand how to walk through. Any questions about money? Money is, money is powerful because it's a good tool, but it also can be used by the enemy to make you think you don't need this other person because you're making so much of it. At the end of the day, you need people. You need people. Are you guys with me? When my wife was going through her battle with cancer, it doesn't matter how much money you had in our stocks, in our savings, in our mutual fund, how many investments we had, all I wanted God to do was give her life at that point. 
my, I, didn't check, I didn't check my bank statements for almost three months because it was irrelevant at that point. While she was going through chemo, how much money I made meant absolutely nothing. Are you with me? So don't let life happen for you to get to back to common sense. Because your battle may not be cancer, it may be something else. And what's going to hold you together in this tough time is what you built before that crisis. Because the crisis will rip through whatever was never there. Are we good? Yes, sir. Yeah, somebody had a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know, like, we got married young. We mm -hmm. didn't really have anything, so that whole combining finances was fairly easy. Do you have any additional advice that you give to people who are getting married a little older mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, the advice would be is to have a vision conversation, number one, okay? So if we're coming together, why are we coming together? The why question is very important. Is this just an arrangement so that you have companionship or partnership? And if the person feels like, well, I made all this by myself, so I don't want you to benefit from it, let's agree of what percentage you want me to benefit from. I, I just personally, I mean, I'm biased. I just think if I can give you my body... Y'all see that look? Yeah. <laughs> if I can give you my body, which is the most precious and sacred God-given thing, what is paper? Unless I have another plan. When Emma and I got married, and I know this may not be the case for everyone because life happens and things happen, and this is not a judgment. When Emma and I got married, we, we took divorce off the table as an option that was not available to us. So whatever issue we had, we had to work it out. Now, unfortunately, some people probably didn't have that level of conviction. They've gone through things and this is not, God can restore and he's a restorer, right? But learn, learn that if we're together, we're together for life. And if something happens where we have to separate, let's still be godly about it and let's be fair. Because whether you work for it or not, let's say you, you're the husband and you work, the wife stayed home, she contributed to, that, to the wealth. Because her time and her mothering is worth money. If the husband it made less than you, but he helped you because you went to school and he held it down. So I'm talking to Christians here, right? Be godly in everything because God rewards people who are godly. Don't be nasty. Don't be petty. Don't be small. If the person wants 50%, sow that into their life. Sow it. Are we good? Because we're governed by different, the world goes through nasty divorces. Even if Christian is going to go through a divorce, it should be godly, and even your lawyer should want to come to church. <laughs> Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or fight over the Airbnb, do it for the glory of God. <laughs> So, so that would be my advice. But I would say, I would say before you get married, if there's, a, is there, if there's large amounts of assets, hey, let's talk about that. You know, like, let's say, God forbid, something would have happened to my spouse. God forbid. And, I mean, pff, I, don't, I really don't want to get married again. But, but, you know, and I have some assets. I would have to have the person to understand. Emma and I had some agreements that this would go because we've given some stuff to our church and our will. We've done some stuff for some or other. They have to understand that coming up, coming up, that this was already allocated. Does that make sense? Here's what I believe. Communication and honesty will rule the day if you do it up front. Yes. Are we good? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's fine. Yeah. She declared that from then on her money's money. Yeah. And then we had a lot of conversations about this stuff. 
Mm -hmm. And I understand Well, first of all, her resistance is a symptom mm -hmm. of a deeper issue. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was someone who's married and uh, she's made up in her mind that her husband's never going to have access to her money because of things that have happened. And so nobody's going to move her off of that island. She's, okay, so I always say this. Um, whatever people display as a behavior is a symptom of a deeper issue. So until we discover what the issue is, we're going to keep throwing Tylenol and Motrin at the symptom when really what she needs is antibiotics. Because when you have a fever... A fever is just a symptom of an infection, right? A lingering fever. So that person needs to have a deep conversation of this is just how you're exhibiting some unhealthy thing that's in your life. And you're just digging your heels in on this one because it, it comforts you. So the question is not even why you're not doing this. Is what is the real issue? There's probably some trust, some broken stuff. If you go back in her childhood or somewhere in her journey, something happened, and now the husband's just the, the, the platform on which she's displaying that unhealthiness. So I would say, um, I will give Pastor David um, a link to a book that I, you, need, you need to refer her to, a friend of mine wrote, um, that will begin her on that journey of understanding what the backstory is. Does that make sense? And this goes for anything. Any, any, this, this question could be relevant. Pastor David, I'm, I'm almost done. Any, any, anybody that you see that has a behavior that you coach them, you talk to them, that is a deeper issue that they are not willing to resolve and they are just using that position as a method of comfort. I've, 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 because I have a background in psychology and all that crazy stuff. So, so besides being a pastor, I understand human behavior, right? So, but that's a whole different conversation. All right. So let's move with the sex. Sex. We got kids in the room, so we got to use coded, we got to use coded language. <laughs> so let's debunk the whole thing about sex. I want a woman to read this for me. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Poo. <laughs> what is sex? Sex is the physical expression of what? Emotional and relational intimacy. If those two are not there, you're just abusing each other's body. That's all it is. You go, well, I just got to get my groove on. And that's all you're doing. And that's why people struggle with sex because we miss the God aspect to it. Look what God says. The man and the woman shall be joined together as one, and they'll become one flesh. You know what one flesh meant? You know what you know text means literally? The one flesh means, there's kids in here. Who brought kids? <laughs> okay. okay, the one flesh means um, the biblical principle was supposed to be, they were supposed to be pure um, until the day of marriage. Now, for a lot of us, that we didn't have that privilege because of you know, mistakes or whatever happened. But from a biblical standpoint, that's why they were supposed to be chased. Let me use that word because kids don't want to say chase. They'll think I'm talking about chase bank. They're supposed to be chased, the V word, right? So the oneness would happen when they come together for the first time and the woman's hymen is broken and the little vein in the man's weapon is broken um, and and there's an exchange of blood which creates a covenant because the way you establish a covenant was through blood so when both of their innocence is revealed for the first time they become one flesh now that's in the ideal world let's talk about Orlando Florida <laughs> 2022. <laughs> Even though there may not be any exchange of blood for the first time because whatever happened in life,
But the Bible talks about that act being a spiritual act. That's why it says anyone who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one with her. Intimacy, sexual intercourse, you actually create spiritual ties, soul ties with people. And that's why the stronger the person is spiritual, spiritually, the harder it is to forget them, even if, if you're with your significant other. Because that spirit that's in them is so strong that even though you're enjoying your spouse, you're still reminiscing on that experience of how they touch you and how you felt, how, how they move. Because there's a spiritual bond that happens in spiritual places. Are we good? That's good. That's good. So we're going to unpack that some other time. But. <laughs> so let's talk about biblical truth about sex. So, so real quickly, it's ordained to be experienced between one man and one woman, Right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Hebrews 13, verse 4, says, let, 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 let the marriage bed be defiled. Um, it is God's primary instrument for procreation and physical fulfillment. So it was meant to procreate and to fulfill your desires. It was not meant as a way to abuse and do body counts. <laughs> You're not supposed to have a roadkill record, men. <laughs> Got her, got her, got her. Oh, yeah, got her. No. That's why the Bible, the Bible refers. Y'all want to hear this? Huh? That's why God says, do not bring the offering of a male prostitute into the house. That's why they refer to them as dogs. That's where we get the word. That's where we get that when, we, when a man sleeps around, we say he's a dog. That's in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with my throat. I'm just, I just, I'm just trying to break the silence. <laughs> so, but it is more than a physical connection. It's a spiritual connection with deep spiritual roots. And that's why it's a spiritual act. And that's why if we have no spiritual connection, it hurts. And the person makes excuses because we don't have that intimacy. You can have urgency, but no intimacy. Y'all heard what I just said? I know, I know my time's up. I got to get out of here. Well, you can have what I said, what? Urgency, urgency but no intimacy. And let me just talk through this real quickly. So, so let's talk about the four buckets that fuel the fire. So we'll talk about four buckets, and I'll, get, I'll go through this real quickly. Number one, the first bucket that will fuel the fire is a relational culture. The culture that you establish relationally. Culture is what? Behavior, norms, language, right? How we talk to each other, how we treat each other. Listen to me, men. Can I give you a secret? What you want to happen later on, you start setting up in the morning. Phone calls, texts. You start preparing because for the woman, for the woman, it's up here. For the guy, it's down here. <laughs> So the relational culture. And, and, and you, 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 you create that culture of affirmation, of respect. For the man, you start making him feel, you start building him up. You can't treat the man as if he's just, he just wants you for your body. Sometimes the man wants to be intimate too. And most men who go after other women, it's not because the woman has something different than you. She treats him different. He goes for the experience, not the feeling. <laughs> so number two, second bucket. Second bucket. Oh, sorry. Second bucket. Transformational communication. A lot of us, we do informational communication. I give you the information. I picked up the kids. I did this. Who cares? I mean, how is this transforming me? How is this impacting me? How is your day? And look into their eyes. Ask them how their day. Have that, have that communication where it's like we're building each other up, right? Number three, shared load and responsibilities. Now, I'm going to talk to the men for a minute. You come home. She cooked. She held the kids with homework. She's doing a load of laundry. She's probably doing something else. And you're just watching TV. And you're just making, you're just killing time for her to be done 
with those things because you, know, you got to go to war. <laughs> How about you got in the kitchen to help to wash the dishes, gave the kids a bath, did the homework with them. It was going to take her two hours, took her 45 minutes. All of a sudden now, there's conserved energy. It's called being smart. We good? Yes. Sharing the responsibility of making the person feel like they matter as a person, not as an instrument. Yes. Women, affirming your man when he walks through the door. Meet him at the door. How about dressing up and stop looking like a hot mess? <laughs> Why are you all dressed up? Because the king was coming? Yes. Yes. Huh? Come on now. Why are you all dressed up? My man was coming. If I can look good for my boss, I can look good for my man. Hey! It's about to go off in there. We got the organ? <laughs> I mean, he's been around pretty women, pretty women all day. And he's got to come home to that? I mean, even if he wanted to go to war, he'd be like, uh. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, surprise him. Take off his shoes and have a bubble bath for him. I mean, make him feel like he wants to come home. Are we good? Are we good? Shared roles and responsibility. Number four, so I can get out of here. Mutual satisfaction. People are not interested when they know you, you, only one person is going to benefit. Say that again. I have no interest in going somewhere where I'm not needed. That's good. If, if it's only about you, after your whatever amount of minutes, <laughs> and the older you get, <laughs> can't stop saying, we bow down. <laughs> bow down. All right. But anyway, what I'm trying to say here is make sure the other person feels validated, respected, and appreciated and satisfied. It's very important. Whether it happens before, during, or after, don't leave the scene without making sure that you accomplish the mission. That's what makes it fiery and interesting. But when it's just about you, and I know some pastors teach, well, you know, you're supposed to meet the guy's need because that's your, well, we, we both have needs. Yes. We both have needs. Yes. We both have a need to climax. Yes. Amen. Right? So learn how to get there. Learn their body. Learn what makes them go there. And it's not a bad thing. The church doesn't want to talk about it because we've made it like it's a bad thing. It's a good thing, actually. We good? It's a good thing. So I'm going to end here because there's just so much we could talk about. I just wanted to kind of whet your appetite and give you an idea of what marriage could look like. Because truth of the matter is, it's a good thing because it came from God. When people who are selfish get into a selfless institution, it becomes hard. Let's say it one more time. When people who are selfish enters into a selfless institution, it becomes hard. So my challenge to you tonight is to make sure that you are becoming as selfless as possible to match God's idea for marriage. Because he did say, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Was this helpful to you guys tonight? Yes. Come on, clap it up one more time for Dr. Phil.